If you are new to our channel, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. So Nikki Jabor is an author, a radio show host, and um, has a great website all about gardening. She's well known for her year-round vegetable gardener book. She has a couple other books under her belt, including her newest book, uh, Veggie Garden Remix, 224 New Plants to Shake Up Your Garden and Add Variety. She's from Nova Scotia, Canada. Welcome to the program, Nikki. Hey, Holly and Joey. How are you guys doing? We are doing well. We appreciate you taking time out of your day. I know you got a lot of stuff going on to join us and our listeners and uh, teach some of your wisdom with all of us. Oh, well, thanks. i got to say, this is such a great time of the year to be a vegetable gardener, isn't it? Well, absolutely. And, and we talk about on the program here a lot about mulch and good mulches mm -hmm. and bad mulches. As people start getting into their gardens here, what is the most, why is mulch so important and what are some benefits uh, that we can uh, take uh, even as we go into the warmer portions of the year? You know, I, I'm a big mulcher, and I know you guys are as well because there's so many benefits to mulch. Um, so, it, like, at this time of the year, you know, when I'm starting to plant my tomatoes, another week or so, they get mulched immediately because that will just cover the soil with shredded leaves or straw, and it kind of breaks up, um, you know, the cycle of soil-borne diseases. So by mulching your soil, you're helping prevent the spread of diseases, but it also helps keep the soil moist because it locks in that soil moisture. It prevents weed growth, which is always a good thing. Um, so there's a lot of benefits to mulching your vegetables. So I do try to do a lot of mulching. And in the fall, you know, I'm going around taking back the leaves, people's, you know, curbsides, and I'm mulching them with my mower and bagging them up again. And so I have a pile of shredded leaves in my garden. And I also have a pile of straw bales I bought last fall. And those are what I'm going to use this year mainly for my mulching. But, again, it's just a gardener's best friend because it cuts down on a lot of work. And a lot of times those leaves, uh, we, we capture all the leaves. The neighbors think maybe we're crazy. We brought in calculated <laughs> 2,000 pounds of leaves in our garden this year, untreaded. Um, and we clean up both sides of the street and, and down the block. But uh, we, yeah, And you have to be smart about this. You just can't take any leaves. You want to, you know, leave, the large yard debris you want to leave alone. Uh, we yeah. don't shred our leaves. If you're in the States, and we're going to talk about the chemical ban there in, in Nova Scotia and Canada, mm -hmm. we have to be aware of what we're putting on our lawns if we're going to incorporate that into our compost or garden. But your favorite is leaves or straw. What would you, if you had to pick one or the other? Oh, my God, that's a hard question. <laughs> I think I would go for leaves only because the worms love to break down leaves as well, so it really attracts them. Um, the worm. So I would go for leaves if, if I had to pick one. Um, but I also use mulch other times of the year, too. I mean, I use it in winter for mulching with root crops and other types of vegetables. So there's a lot of ways you can use mulch. So like you, I can never get enough leaves and I can never get enough straw because there's always just so many ways to use it. You can even use it in your pathways to keep down weeds and keep your boots clean as you're working in the garden. So it really is a gardener's best friend. Great. Now, um, you have a chemical ban by where, where you are or where you are. What do you use for weeds, harmful bugs, etc., cetera, uh, without using chemicals? Yeah, I know. Like, you haven't been able to buy weed and feed here for, I don't know, 15 years at least. Yeah, so we don't have any things like weed and feed for your lawns. And, um, you know, at first a lot of people were worried that the dandelions were going to take over the world. And you know what? They didn't. <laughs> so, um, you know, yeah, there's dandelions here and there. And, and a lot of people forage for them now and eat them. And, you know, they, they feed the early bees. So people had to get a little more relaxed, I think, about their lawn expectations. A lot of people here plant a mixed lawn with things like white dust clover to keep down uh, weeds and, and keep that nice dark green color all the time. And in my vegetable garden, um, you know, I'm totally organic. I was even before the chemical ban. I think I've gotten smarter the past 10 or 15 years, though, because I've learned a lot and read a lot. And so I include a lot of uh, bee-friendly plants in my food garden, a lot of flowers to attract bees and beneficial insects. And I find that beneficial insects generally take care of the bad bugs. So I don't have a lot of bad bugs. Um, you know, I do get every once in a while an infestation, and if it's something that's not going to be controlled by, you know, a good bug population, then I'll hand pick. Um, you know, slugs are a problem for me. Um, you know, but generally speaking, I, I maybe resort to a soapy spray once every three or four years. So, you know, by including lots of these good plants to attract the beneficial and bees and the pollinators, it's kind of balanced my garden, and so I don't have a big pest problem, even though I have 20 raised beds in my garden. Now, you say you, you expanded your, your raised bed garden tremendously yeah. last year by about 1,000 square feet. What, how do you build your soil? Obviously, you're, you're not going to bring in new compost every year and rebuild these beds. What's the key here to getting that soil as rich in nutrients as possible? Yeah, that was my big dig. So we bulldozed my old garden, but we saved all the good soil that I had been working on for about you know, 14, 15 years at that point and put in a big pile. So when we built the new 20 raised beds, 
we backfilled with that good soil, but it, it wasn't enough, of course. So um, I did buy some local organic garden soil, and then I added lots of chopped leaves to the soil. You know, I added some of my own homemade compost. I added some composted manures. So I do add a lot of natural amendments to my soil um, in the spring, but also between successive crops. So if I plant early peas, when those come out, I'll add something else to the soil, maybe a little aged manure or some compost before I plant something else in that same space. Um, and our soils here are also acidic, so I do have to lime every year. Um, but I'm a big believer in the natural, you know, um, amendments to use, of course. You know, so there's so many of those you can use to enrich your soil. Even seaweed, because I'm a stone's throw from the ocean, so I can collect seaweed and add that to my compost pile or to my garden in the fall to break down all winter long. Um, so just keep adding natural amendments to your soil. And, uh, you know, I avoid chemical-based fertilizers because I really want to, you know, kind of encourage that, you know, the, the uh, fungi and the bacteria in the soil to take off and, and, and help nourish my plants. Right, and in addition to the, the chemical-free fertilizer, you don't have to worry about if you do accidentally over-fertilize, over it's not going to burn <laughs> the plants. True. Uh, yeah, there's definitely not generally a problem with organics. Um, uh, you know, and when I say manure, I do say aged manure mm -hmm. because fresh manure, A, can burn plants and B, introduce harmful organisms you don't want on your food. So make sure if you're using manure, it's at least a year old. And I usually use either uh, aged cow manure or aged sheep manure. But, you know, that's my Mother's Day present every year, which I think is the best present you could give a girl, a truckload of aged manure. I'm just saying. Good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Um, and, you, and now in your newest book, Veggie Garden Remix, you give a lot of ideas on a large varieties of possibly atypical vegetables to grow. What are some of your favorites you were surprised to possibly uh, that you found that are grown in a northern climate? Yeah, I was surprised by a lot <laughs> because this book was kind of inspired by my mother-in-law who's from Lebanon. And so, you know, basically I wanted to grow plants that she would know, like food plants that she would recognize. And I didn't honestly expect a lot of success. Um, but I was super surprised that um, I did have a lot of success. You know, my success has far outstripped any failures. And so we grow Lebanese cucumber melons and za'atar. Um, you know, I grow Lebanese gourds for, that we use like summer squash. You know, and then I grow things like ground cherries and inca berries and tomatillos and all these things, that, you know, as a gardener in Nova Scotia, as a teenager, you know, and, and even, you know, uh, before, we didn't grow these things in our gardens. You know, it was tomatoes and beets and carrots and potatoes and so to try all these wonderful global crops, it has just expanded, you know, my cooking so wonderfully. Um, you know, my kids love all the variety as well. And it just keeps my vegetable garden interesting. You know, you know we tend to get in a bit of a rut, I think, sometimes. So, you know, the cucumelons. I love cucumelons. I talk about them all the time. And everybody loves the cucumelons in our garden. Plus, you know, the ground cherries are very popular because uh, they're so sweet and delicious and so easy to grow. If you can grow a cherry tomato, you can grow a ground cherry. So um, also Indian cucumbers and all the greens from China and Japan and Korea. So uh, if, if I have one message from this book, it's just try at least one new thing in your garden this year because it should be your, your fun experimental little area where you can try something new and, and just have fun. And that's I'm a big believer in playing in your garden. I want to touch on the ground cherries for a minute. That's something yeah. that we're going to <clears throat> be growing this year for the very first time. Explain what a ground cherry is and what kind of flavor, because I understand it's kind of like a pineapple, vanilla, caramel yeah. type of taste, okay? How, how does a ground cherry grow, grow essentially here? It's a tomato relative, so it kind of, it's an interesting looking plant. It grows up for about a foot and a half, and then it grows out for about three feet, kind of like an umbrella. Um, but it produces all these wonderful little uh, husks, and inside the protective papery husks are the fruits. And they're about the size of a marble, and they do taste like pineapple vanilla, sometimes an overtone of peach, um, and when they're really ripe, it's like butterscotch. They're so good. We eat them from the garden. I dip them in chocolate. We make jam from them and sauces, and we do lots of things with the ground cherries. They are so popular in our garden. I love them so much. Um, and they're easy to grow, so if you can grow, again, cherry tomato, you can grow a grand cherry, sunshine, decent soil, and they start producing for me in August, and they go until late October, uh, so we get quite a large bumper crop of, cher of uh, grand cherry. I'm going to jump back to your raised beds here. A lot of people want to start a garden, and, and they want to go raise beds because that's a, a, an in basically instantaneous garden. You don't have to yeah. dig the soil, all that. What's the biggest mistake people make when they say, hey, okay, I'm going to put a raised bed in the backyard? Uh, I think if you're going to grow food, make sure you find the sun. Because, you know, if you're putting a raised bed in the backyard and it's partially shady or under big trees, you're not going to have a lot of success unless you just grow leafy green. So look for the sunshine. I also, underneath my raised beds, and mine are 4 by 8 or 4 by 10, and they're 16 inches tall. There are some plans for it on my website, Savvy Gardening. You can see my design. Um, you know, I put cardboard underneath before I filled with the soil to help prevent 
weeds, because I certainly have a lot of perennial forest weeds in my area, so I want to prevent that. Um, so that's important. And, you know, I think that's really the most important considerations. Look for the sunshine. Uh, and raised beds, of course, you know, they offer so many benefits. They drain well. They warm up early. I mean, I have 20 raised beds, and I spend less than, say, an hour and a half a week working in my garden because, you know, the plants are planted close together. I don't have a lot of weeds because I stay on top of it. So there's not a lot of maintenance to a raised bed. It's definitely an easier way to grow food. Definitely. Um, thanks for that information. Now tell us how to find you, your book, et cetera, uh, so that people can get all your great information. Yeah, thanks, Holly. Um, so people can find me online, of course, at SavvyGardening.com. is my website I own with a couple other garden writers, SavvyGardening.com. And, um, of course, you can also find me, at my book's in any bookstore across North America, uh, as well as online, all the usual places online. Um, and uh, I'm on Instagram, Twitter, and uh, Facebook, of course, as well. I'd love to hear from people there. We, uh, you know, I know we're in Nova Scotia, kind of far from you guys, but we have a lot of listeners, even in your neck of the woods, that listen to my radio show every Sunday uh, online because it airs live online, which is fun. So, um, you know, you can always tune into that as well, and there's information at NikkiJabor.com. Yeah, your three books are, are The Year-Round Vegetable Gardener, and then yeah. uh, I'm, I'm... Groundbreaking Food Garden. There you go, and then the 224 Plants. Uh, the veggie garden mix of the 224 plants to shake up your vegetable garden. And if, if you're able to grow them in Nova Scotia, Canada, we should have no <laughs> problem growing them here in, in the upper Midwest of the United States. Exactly. <laughs> well, Nikki, we greatly yeah. appreciate your time and your knowledge, not only for Holly and myself, but all of our listeners as well. Oh, well, thank you so much. You guys are so inspiring. I love all that you do. So thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me today. Absolutely. Thank and you. Thank you for checking out the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show. For more, go to the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com for full length in studio video and podcast replay of season one. Season two underway and added weekly. Tweet us at TWVG Show or hashtag TWVG to be part of the program.